Hello and welcome to Spartan Life Radio. I'm your host, Cheryl Wilkerson. Thanks for joining me on a Sunday afternoon. And I have on the line with me, Lisa McKinley. Lisa, Mc- Lisa McKinley is the owner of Exquisite Beauty Hair Replacement Center. That is a woman and veteran-owned small business right here in the 757 in Chesapeake, to be exact. She is a practicing certified hair loss practitioner, a cranial prosthesis provider, And she has been a licensed Virginia cosmetologist for over 20 years. And when I tell you Lisa McKinley is on a mission, I'm going to get I'm going to prove to you today during this conversation that she is on a mission. Welcome to Spartan Life Radio. Thank you. How are you doing on this Sunday afternoon? I'm doing fantastic. Good, good, good. Now, we want to get into this with you because I just read, you know, part of your bio right there. But what I am really interested in is what you are doing with your 501c3 nonprofit organization. It's called Wigs for Purpose. What is Wigs for Purpose? (laughs) Tell us about that. Yes, um, Wigs for Purpose is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that helps disenfranchise women that have, you know, that have experienced alopecia, hair loss. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what we do is we increase awareness, we um, donate complimentary, complimentary or affordable wigs, and create employment. And through that, we do that through partnerships with individual organizations and just and, and and individuals that help donate wigs to help us make this possible. Okay, so let's go back. First and sure. foremost, what got you interested in cosmetology? <sighs> From the age um, at during the age I was seven years old, watching my mother's friends braid her hair, and mm-hmm. I was like, I want to do that. So I started with braiding hair on my mother's head, and then baby dolls, and as I became a teenager, I started doing girls from school down the street, neighbors down the street, and then when I joined the military, I still find myself love doing hair, so during my tour, I decided to go to hair school in California in 93, Mm -hmm. and I wasn't able to finish all the way, but then I was still involved in doing hair. I was pulled into doing hair for shows, even though I wasn't licensed at that time. But mm-hmm. I became certified, uh, licensed when I got stationed here in Virginia in 2002. So that's when you were a little now. girl. And I've just been doing hair ever since. It's my passion. When you were it. a little girl and you were a teenager doing hair, did people say, that girl going to grow up and she's going to do hair. She's going to do some yes. hair when she grows up. Is that what they said? <laughs> Yes, yes. We were amazed of how straight I would get the hair, you know, using a um, blow dryer and a brush at that time, you know. Right. And, mm-hmm. then, <laughs> and yeah, I just love how creative I am with the different looks. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what they said, you didn't push back from what they said. You embraced what they said when you were I younger. embraced it. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, okay. And you never get tired of doing it because I look at hairstylists and I'm like, how do you all just stay in there? And you take the teeniest, you know, strands of hair, two and three strands, and you all just keep working and keep working. And just I have a cousin in Richmond and she does the locks. I'm like, mm-hmm. I just don't have the patience. I don't, I don't have the skill or the patience, Lisa. And I am amazed by you all that do. It is amazing to me. I, you know, I'm glad you asked me that because, you know, people look at it two ways. They look at it for the money or it's the passion. For me, it's the passion. And when you love doing hair, me, I like to see how women transform. You know, they mm-hmm. come in our chair, they may start out having a bad day, but once they see that new look, they are amazed. They are, like, rejuvenated. They're excited, you know. So I love the outcome. And I just love to pour into um, my um, my clients, you know. And the next thing I know, you know, I, I just see a difference in their life, and more and more people gravitate to me. They hear the the con- sincerity that I have and the passion, the love. So you wouldn't mind 
you know, working long hours, you know, to mm-hmm. help. Because I look at it as a ministry. It's not right. just okay. being here. So your passion becomes your purpose, and your purpose, once you look at it that way to me, and, mm-hmm. you know, I love God, and, and it's like a way of God blessing you. So the money will come. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about what is going on today and women and hair. And you hear, Lisa, you hear so much about these edges. What, what is, go- first yeah. of all, what's going on with the edges? Explain that to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's several things that's going on. Well, you know, women these days are finding out more about hair extensions or braiding. So a lot of times they tend to go to um, non-professionals that are, you know, causing uh, a lot of tension around the hairline. So they experience what is called traction alopecia, where it's pulled so tight that the follicles come out, okay? So oh, wow. it usually damages the, the front hairline. And then another thing is um, hair loss uh, is really caused internally. Um, so your mm-hmm. hair is like a barometer to tell you what's actually going on. So you okay. realize that um, it could be you are uh, malnourished, poor diet, stress, and a lot of different factors. So that's why you will see uh, the edges come up a lot of times. So, because yeah. the hair grows from the inside out, not just on the top out. of a head, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> That's right. Okay. That's right. That does make sense. That does make sense. Mm-hmm. I have a pet peeve with some ladies because sometimes I will see ladies and it's not because they can't do better, but there are some that seem they will tell you, I don't want to have to do anything to my hair. I don't understand that, Lisa, because even if you have a bald head, don't you have to keep that shaved? I just I don't. I don't know where that uh, thought or that uh, attitude has come from where we just don't want to be bothered with our crown and glory. Our own hair. And the reason why is because, you know, the awareness of wearing weeds and hair extensions, you can do a whole lot more to it. And they want to save what they have. But in the meantime, depending on how they actually wear the hair and extensions is causing more damage than harm. So whoever you actually go to to actually receive that kind of service, they mm-hmm. have to uh, be able to to express the importance of how long you should actually wear or whether or not you can or cannot wear uh, braids or hair extensions because of the, the actual density of the hair, how thick or thin the hair is. You know what I'm saying? So, Are you, you teaching me that everybody can't wear everything? Is that what you're teaching me? That's right. That's right. That's okay. Exactly okay. It. Okay. And what about people with locks? The longer they get, sometimes I worry that they are pulling on the top. And I don't know if that will affect the follicles on top. I don't, I don't know. Yes, and it, it does. It does. Uh, it just all depends on who they go to. If they actually paying attention to um, the amount of hair that's within a square inch, you know, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. are they able to handle the actual weight of the lock? And if if that is so, you notice in the hair thin, they should immediately take it out. I am speaking. I'm speaking to Lisa McKinley. She's the owner of Exquisite Beauty Hair Replacement Center. It's located in Chesapeake. She has a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It's called Wigs for Purpose. Can you do a little bit more bragging to the listening audience about Wigs for Purpose? Yes. A Wigs for Purpose is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We help disenfranchised women that experience hair loss. Alopecia is what we know it as. By increasing awareness of our program, we uh, donate complimentary wigs and affordable wigs and to create employment in the future. So, How do um, people get receive your donations? Do you do it through women's shelters or um, teach us how you do this? Yes. Um, they actually refer from um, different organizations um, like churches, uh, like the American Cancer Society, 
um, different cancer centers, they actually come to me, and mm-hmm. we I, I find out their need as far as a wig is concerned, and I fit them for that wig, and they are actually um, placed on their head. Another way in the future, because we, we are just getting started here um, this okay. year, where we are raising funds so that we be able to, um, for them to receive hair care vouchers. But we are donating services as of now. So if they need hair care assistance, we are able to help as well. So they just contact us and we'll uh, look and see what we can provide for them as far as a free wig or a service, a donated service. So the great thing about this is that they might get a wig, but they might get another service as well. And am I saying it correctly that once they get one service with you, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only time they might get more follow-up services? Um, It could be as we expand and grow, you know, um, mm-hmm. right now it's either or. Um, okay. But that's the goal. That's the goal. Because a lot of times, you know, a, a woman goes through a hardship, you know, um, they lose right. a job, they're not bringing in the income and stuff. So, like, you know, for the example of the woman that goes to dress for success, they're able to get a suit, um, you know, some dress attire for an interview. Well, we are the top of that. I look at it that way. So they'll be able to get a unit, a wig, or they get uh, hair care assistance like uh, shampoo and style, something like that. So they can look uh, the part for, you know, whatever they are trying to get, like a job or just everyday life just to uplift and empower the women. Mm -hmm. Lisa, what what do do they say to you? What do these women say to you once that you have restored their confidence, you've given them a wig or you have given them services? What, what do they say to you? Oh my, what they say to me. Oh, Uh, they'll turn around and say, wow, I haven't seen this woman in a very long time. Um, I've actually had it where the spouse say, wow, Look at my wife. You saved my marriage. Um, mm. and, uh, yes. Um, I mean, they break down and cry in my chair. Um, and they say, oh, I, I just can't believe I, I can look this way. It's, it's a lot that a woman goes through when they lose their hair. And that's why it's in the Bible to say a woman's hair is a crown and glory. Because that's what gets us going. It's the first thing we see. When we look in the mirror, yes, we look at our face, but we look at our crown. So when I look at the, my wigs are like crowning a woman, a winner in God, you know, mm-hmm. that crown is going to re, rejuvenate that woman, empower that woman, you know, and we do that one wig at a time. And that's part of our mission. And when you are talking about empowering, what response or I'm sure you've come across women that have gone completely bald. From what yes. I understand, women that do that, that's a very powerful statement that they are making, correct? Yes, they are. Yes. Yes, they are. Matter of fact, I had a call yesterday. Um, the woman was like, you know, I am completely bald, and it is because I just don't know what to do. But I, mm-hmm. I, I just can't afford to actually get my hair done. And this is the only way. I say, well, you're at the right place, you know. We are okay. able to help you with that, and we will find a wig for you that will be conducive to your look, you know, to bring out the beauty that's already there, you know. So You yeah, offer, so, you offer mm-hmm. some sort of consultation to, because yes, I I'm imagining when they call, you could have many wigs, but you have to talk to them about their style or their the look they want to achieve. Yes. Yes, yes. All they have to do is to give us a call, and we will set up a one-on-one private consultation uh, with them, you know, so they know um, what are their options. They actually be given the wig and everything, yes. Where do you see this 501c3? Where do you see this in five wow. years? What What are your goals? What is the mission? Wigs yes. for purpose. Yeah. What's the mission? Okay. All right. So our mission is to uplift and empower women in need that have experienced their alopecia one wig at a time. We are creating partnerships with the beauty industry and other organizations to impact economic growth and to provide a sense of purpose. 
So in five years, we plan to have our own boutique and a boutique to where they have uh, actual either a storefront or we may have some other ways of doing it, like doing it online to where they'll see the options that they can get to choose the rig and to be able to um, purchase or, you know, get that assistance they need virtually because a lot of times they're not able to um, get to the actual location, the storefront. So an actual boutique they can come to to get assistance or to buy affordable wigs. Mm-hmm. How many people do That's you have helping you? How how many people do you have helping you with wigs for purpose? Uh, I have right now. I have board member is a total of five right now. And, Wonderful. And as far as like uh, helping me with that is myself along with my children. <laughs> I have three. Oh, uh, that's great. Ladies. Yes, and they help me with that. But I, I need more help. Because <laughs> we have a lot of wigs that need to be revitalized, and that's another way when we talk about economic growth and um, employment, because we follow the three E's, and uh, I want to talk about that. Um, the donations, well, not only we talk about the empowering and encouraging a woman, but we're going to bring awareness, which is the education piece, and then that last is the employment. And that's in the future where we have the boutique where people can get a job to retail the wigs to the ladies and also provide uh, hair care assistance and to refurbish the wigs that are coming into our boutique. So we'll be able to um, give it back to the women or we can retail it at an affordable cost. The yeah, wigs so. that you, the wigs that you have, are wigs that have been donated by ladies that no longer want those wigs. Is that correct? Yes, they are gently used. Now we're very selective on the wigs that we actually take in. Okay, they are mm-hmm. new because a lot of times they'll buy a wig from the store, and there's so many women that buy purchase a wig from the store, and they look at it, put it on, and say, "Oh, I don't like it. I don't want to wear it," and they just don't, and they just put it to the side. You know, and they forget about it. So once they hear about my organization, they're like, oh, wow, I can actually donate to this organization and then we can um, refurbish it and give it out to a person in need. So it's That like, makes perfect sense to me because if yeah. you buy a wig, you can't return the wig. <laughs> exactly. So you right. can give it to us and we can be a blessing to someone else. Okay. So and and since... And since you're a 501c3, if it's important to someone who has donated to you, they they can get credit for that donation, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, they can. They surely can. Okay. Now, I know, ladies, I know it's plenty of you all out there that have some wigs that either you've already enjoyed, they're gently used, you're not going to ever wear them again. I need you to be in contact with Miss Lisa today. And sp- <laughs> speaking of that, Lisa, how can people get in contact with you? Yes, um, they can um, contact me. Um, there are several ways. We are located at 1580 Crossways Boulevard, um, Section 103 in Chesapeake, Virginia, 23320. Or you could actually give us a call um, at 757 757- Five six three four eight nine two. We on social media platforms of Instagram at Wix for Purpose VA or Facebook Wix for Purpose. The number four. I have to stress the number four because sometimes I just use the letter. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, and um, we also accept the monetary donations because you know it takes money to help with the upkeep of you know the operational expenses and to create the um, vouchers as well. So, to, I'm, to, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I was going to say I'm a little nosy, so I don't know how you refresh a wig. So when you get the wig in, you don't have to go into, mm-hmm. you know, big detail, but just give us the yeah. Cliff Notes version of how you refresh a wig. Well, we use um, actual products that disinfect any bacteria, if there's any, in, in the wig. Um, and we refresh, you know, the smell with you know, basic shampoos and conditioners. And there's other things that we use as well. Uh Wonderful, wonderful. It sounds like that you have 
You have, well, you know what, with your background in cosmetology and all, okay. you know, to me, you're almost like a chemist anyway. So I know you have that all figured out. I am impressed. I am impressed because while I'm talking to you about wigs for purpose, I need to let the listening audience know that you're a member of the American Hair Loss Council, the Professional Beauty Association, Black Brand. You volunteer yeah. with the American Cancer Society, the Chesapeake Democratic Women, and yeah. you're the proud mom. You have served our nation and served our nation well in the Navy, and you have dual master's degrees as well so i mean yes, you ma'am. are it <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> lisa this just, is just go ahead i just want to be an example um to young women that you can do it no matter what you know i've faced you know experienced some challenges in life but i never gave up i never gave up so yeah, but where did I, you I get that so. spirit from where did you get that spirit that i don't Nobody give up where did you get that from <laughs> <laughs> yes. Where did you get that fighting spirit? Well, I would say just looking at, you know, um, just the different women in my family. I, you know, I lost my mother at a very young age. So I went through a lot of things in life. So just by looking at the strong women that poured into me and my relationship with God, you know, being under the great tutelage of of different churches, you know, different, and especially out here, um, Bishop Kim Brown and my apostle now, Apostle Ro, uh, Christopher Spells, they really helped me out in my spiritual walk and how to stay strong and keeping God first in my life. Yes. So we that's are, what I learned, and I keep persevering. Mm-hmm. Well, we're yeah. grateful for that spirit because that spirit is helping so many ladies that need you, like you said, for whatever reason, they're down and out and they're not feeling good about themselves. I know. I know how I feel when I sit my behind in that chair. And then when I get up and my crown and glory is totally different, I know yeah. how I feel. So I understand about these ladies. Look, even though, Miss Lisa, I used to fight with my stylist about having to sit under that dryer. Now <laughs> I appreciate sitting under that dryer. And I just take my book and I just politely go to sleep. And I know that's what's best for my hair. That's right. <laughs> And, you know, the education piece is what's important, you know, that I do stress, especially as me being a certified hair loss uh, practitioner. you got to understand how hair works and that hair loss begins from within. Um, Mm -hmm. It's what you go through in life, stress, you know, what you intake, your diet. It's different things, you know, or it's something that, that has triggered that imbalance inside your body. So... I think when once people are aware of that, you know, mm-hmm. they're educated, the uh, why things happen, you know, on top. Um, I think people will do better, you know, when they know better, you know. You right, you know better, you do better. I want to <laughs> thank right. you. Lisa McKinley, the owner of Exquisite Beauty Hair Replacement Center in Chesapeake. And also she has established this wonderful 501c3 nonprofit organization. It's called Wigs for Purpose. That's W-I-G-S, the number four purpose. Check her out on social media. And Miss Lisa, keep doing what you're doing. Please stay strong. This is added value to the community. And I think that you will be long remembered for making your mark and helping other people out because that is what we are put on this earth to do, I believe. Help one another. Yes. Thank you so much, Ms. Wilkinson. I do also want to stress my, na- my name has changed to Lisa Brewer on social media. So, you know, people are going to have to get used to that. But, you know, people know me as Lisa Mack. So I will match you. I'm a maker of a crown, M-A-C. So, <laughs> I like it. So, I like yeah, I'm that. I'm still Lisa Mack. It's just, you know, I'm back to my father's uh, name, Brewer. So. <laughs> okay. Just and is that B R E W E R? That's right. That's right. Lisa Brewer. B R E W E R. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time here on this Sunday afternoon on Spartan oh, Life Radio. You, <laughs> no, you have to call me Cheryl. You have to call me Cheryl. Okay, and, um, Cheryl. 
<laughs> there we go. Thank you so much, and I'm sure we'll be talking in the future. Take care, okay? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. No problem. There mm-hmm. you have it. Another young lady right here in the 757 making her mark and doing great things in the community. Coming up next, we have a young man, and guess what? He's doing the same thing, just in a different arena. I'm telling you, we have some great people all around us. Okay, so don't go anywhere. It's Spartan Life Radio. I'm your host, Cheryl Wilkerson. Welcome back to Spartan Life Radio. I'm your host, Cheryl Wilkerson. On the line with me right now, an assistant professor of history and interdisciplinary studies right here at the great Norfolk State University. We welcome to the program, Dr. Derek Lenoy. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So I'm excited about talking to you because I have spoken to some people. I'm not sure if you've taught them or not, but they've been around your presence and thought very highly of you, Dr. Lenoy. And they're like, oh, (laughs) you need to have him on the show. He's going to be great. So, uh, again, I thank you for coming on today. And we have a lot to talk about. You were raised by a single parent. Grew up in Memphis. Dr. Lenoy, you have 99 degrees. When are you going to stop? <laughs> when uh, are you going to stop? I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna so keep on let going. me see. Well, let me, if I'm wrong, you check me, but I'm going to try to run this down, okay? okay? Okay. All right. University of Memphis, Bachelor of Arts in History, minor in African and African American Studies. Yeah. Uh, Master of Arts in Liberal Studies, University of Memphis. Yeah. Georgia State, PhD in History, Graduate Certificate in Women's Studies. Yes. Second Master's of Arts in Journalism, this one from the University of Memphis. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's correct. And then what is the status of Master of Fine Arts, Documentary Expression, Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi? You have completed that? No, I'm in the uh, thesis stage. And so COVID threw that off uh, where I should have graduated already, but I hadn't. But I plan to graduate by the end of this year. Congratulations early. Uh, Let me be the first one, okay? All right. Thank you. No doubt in my mind that you will get that done. And so where did this great love of learning, where did that generate from? Where, what was the genesis of that? Well, my mother used to say uh, the worst thing that ever happened to me was education, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Because once I started learning, not only was it a, I was a sponge for it, but then she couldn't say things in secret anymore, couldn't spell words. And stuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was, it was just a natural curiosity. And so the the so there was so as you said I was raised by a single parent and in a uh, economically depressed community in Memphis and so for listeners that's from Memphis I'm from North Memphis I'm from the Hollywood Springdale area for people that are familiar with that uh, and it was an economically depressed community and so although we had different professionals uh, in that space. Education wasn't seen as one of the main outlets or where you could um, shine in uh, like a public type of atmosphere. So I really right. got a hold of African-American history and studies in mm-hmm. college. And once that world was open unto me, it I became really curious about the world that had been, always been around me. I didn't understand the world, right? I didn't understand uh, the structural, uh, systemic, and systematic racism that brought me to that North Memphis, Hollywood, Springdale community and what was making uh, the decisions that we thought was free, uh, free will decisions, and they weren't Mm -hmm. because they were part of this system. And so uh, college gave me the opportunity to unlock some things. And so once I unlocked one thing, and, and because blackness is such a... Um, diverse concept. It touches so many different things. I did not want to learn all of it. And so I started pursuing degrees to learn all of it. <laughs> Let me ask you this. When you were in college and it all started clicking, did you ask a lot of questions in class or out of class of your professors? And if you did, 
were they open to all of these questions? So, so I, I got two stories. Um, okay. So one of the stories is because I, 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 so I was an undergrad for six years. I thoroughly enjoyed undergrad, right? And so I thoroughly mm-hmm. enjoyed it. But my junior year was actually, it really became my freshman year because this is my first year of taking real African-American study classes and making this difference turn in those first two years I just wasn't prepared for. And so in that um, third year, I had come across a couple of professors. And this one professor, he made me believe that, because I was at a PWI instead of an HBCU, right? Although, right, right. Uh, the student population uh, at this PWI, because it was in Memphis, uh, was larger than NSU student population, black, uh, well, NSU complete student population right now. Um, but all of those people, you know, were African, of African descent, African Americans from the United States. And so um, he made me believe that that black people rose and fell on my shoulder. And so he made me understand, or well, I don't know if I understand is the right word, but he made me believe that I needed to sit in the front of the classroom. I needed to participate wow. in class. I needed to do the work. Because if I did not do the work and white people could see that I was failing, then they could say black people are failing, right? And so he put the um, pressure of achievement on for all black people on my one on my little shoulder, and I had mm-hmm. to show up and show out in my classes to do that. And so mm-hmm. in another professor's class. But wait a minute, uh, pinning it. Would you okay. do that to a student today as a professor? Would you do that? Well, so it's, I, I, I believe some of uh, the theoretical framework that I, I work under is this concept called womanism. And under womanism, or well, one of the, the uh, main tenets of womanism, according to Laylee Phillips, who um, now is Laylee Marathon, she, she wrote this book called The Woman's Reader. And one of the things she talked about was this concept of common weal. And common weal is this idea, because we live in the commonwealth now, right? Well, I, mm-hmm. now for me. Um, and mm-hmm. so it, it, it's the idea that you do what's best for the majority, right? You do oh, what's wow. best for the majority. So that means you might have to sacrifice your individual needs for mm-hmm. what is best for the majority. And so I operate from that perspective. And so I okay. believe African Americans and, and people of African descent uh, in this world will always be judged by the least of us. Mm-hmm. which means we have a responsibility to each of us. Mm-hmm. And okay. so because of that, I would put that on them because I think that's part of what black excellence is about, is to say that not only are you capable of doing, right, but you mm-hmm. have a responsibility to do. You have but, a responsibility but, but we've to make always, your lifetime. We've always taught that in our community, though, haven't we? Ah, but, but uh, so we have... I would say Generation Z and Generation A are getting it differently at this point in the way that they want to enact it. And so we we have a responsibility to have to teach uh, this. I, I don't know what kind of social media um, platform that you listen to, but Clubhouse is one of the, of the platforms to, for me that is amazing because I'm now hearing – from people, like everybody's an expert on social media, but what's so interesting is that in these social media spaces, uh, people of African descent are now having conversations that are ahistorical. They, they have no historical meaning. And so, and so to that point, there are people right now of African descent that's trying to tell people who are quote-unquote mulatto or mixed that they have no business speaking up or speaking out against and for black issues. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. W.B. Right. Du Bois is mixed. Booker T. Washington is mixed, right? Mm-hmm. right? I can keep on naming. Frederick Douglass, I can keep on naming all these African Americans, historically, who are seen as African Americans, who now in the 21st century, under this Generation Z uh, defining of what blackness is and what it is not, wouldn't make the cut. Oh, so okay. We got to have different. We got to have conversations with them to understand. Not, not like I said, blackness has this diversity, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we don't want to believe it has a diversity. Now we try to limit blackness. Like one of my students, when she introduced herself, she said that she do white activities. I said, "So what now?" She's like, "I do white activities." And I'm like, "What is a white activity?" 
And then she went, she was like, I like outdoors. I like hiking and, uh, and all that, right? And I'm like, you know, there's, there are whole organizations dedicated to African Americans being outdoors. Correct. Right? Correct. <laughs> and so the, the, there's, the but, blackness but, but, is but, not limited by blackness. But Dr. Lenoy, was she saying that to and somehow set herself apart like I'm I'm a different pedigree than you? Or was she saying that you think in pure like, well, I'm just letting you know that this is what I like? She was saying it not for either one of those reasons. One of the things that's really interesting about post uh, Jim Crow, um, former Jim Crow, is that. Black people try to take black people black cards for their yes. activities. Yes. And so now all of a sudden you can talk black. I mean, talk white. Now all of a sudden you can dance white. Like all these things create, if you do these things, you're black. If you do these things, you're white. Mm-hmm. And so especially for African-Americans who have achieved in K-12 spaces, when they get to college, they're so used to being told how not black they are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And that, okay. this, that these are black spaces and these are the black things that we do. Uh, and so if we get into a little African-American studies, there's this theory called performance theory. And part of the idea of performance theory is that we all performing. Uh, one of my good friends, uh, he wrote this paper about uh, he was in this class about consumer uh, um, um, yeah, consumer culture. And one of the things he came up with as a concept is that African-Americans since the ending of uh, form of Jim Crow, African Americans have been consuming their blackness. And what does that mean is that you got to consume it through the movies, through the mm-hmm. music, through mm-hmm. the language, right? Because mm-hmm. you got to show other black people how black you are by your relationship to what you buy and perform as black. Okay. So if I, if I don't know how to play spades if yep. I don't like to watch uh, whatever empire on TV, if I don't yep. even really like social media, but I have to do it because of my job, my card is gone. I'm not black. Some people, some people don't take your card. They're going to take it quick. I, I'm a vegetarian. I'm a black vegetarian who's a southerner. People take my, and, and even when I was eating meat, I never had chitlins. Or right, tongue or tail mm-hmm. or feet, and never mm-hmm. will. Right, like, mm-hmm. I ain't, that's nasty, and I ain't never gonna eat it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry <laughs> like I'm sorry. hoghead. Right? Somebody asked me about hoghead. I asked my grandmother about it. She was like, "Lord God, don't eat it." <laughs> <laughs> right, like look, look, I, I, look. I'm sorry, and then and then not only would they take your black card, they then would do this other thing. Right, they would call you bougie, or now because politics and respectability has moved out of academia. And it has gone into the community. And so now people are talking about all oh, respectability politics and, you know, and all this other kind of stuff. And just like, no, no. Why right? blackness is so vast in, in our history. I know that's not what we're supposed to be talking about, but our history. You're fine. Is so much about a particular class of African Americans dictating what the rest do. And so back then it was a quote unquote title of the tent. That was dictating it. Correct. Now it's poor. The idea of poorness is the idea of what blackness is. How close you are to being poor, mm-hmm. and, and which also poor means criminal. So how close you are to being poor and a criminal, the blacker you are. The further you get away from that, the whiter you are. Right. But, That's but a what? Doggone problem. But what, Doctor Lenoy? What if you are the vegetarian? You don't play the spades, whatever. And you don't, it doesn't bother you what other black people think of you. What What about that? I, why should it bother someone who's out in the community being productive? Why should it bother you what other black people think of you? So going back to the original question of how would I put that on my students? I would put it on my students because we, we are, to me, I'm a Pan-Africanist. And so as a Pan-Africanist, all people of African descent, no matter their locale, are connected to one another and have a responsibility to the other and to the homeland. And so, the re- so it doesn't matter if they think I'm black enough or, or how black I am, but I, what I need them to do and what I need to do is for us to put in work in our own communities that's moving us forward, not you forward, 
right? Mm-hmm. Or your right. family right. forward, right. us forward. Right. 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 And so that means that there's got to be some level of sacrifice. And so let's go back. So this Black History Month is dealing with wellness, um, right? The food mm-hmm. that we eat that make us so-called black, right, mm-hmm. is killing us. Soul food, Correct. the movie, Big Mama died because of soul food. How they end the movie? Correct. Eating soul food. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Right? What's the message? Soul mm-hmm. food is fine. Even if it cut off your leg or you know, because of diabetes or heart disease and all that. Like, like going back to you talking to your grandma about eating uh, this hog head. That was food that they would had to do, right? Because of economics, not because it had anything to do with them trying to prove that they were black to other people. And I will submit to you that that hog head or chitlins or whatever that they were eating back then, especially coming out of slavery, it was healthier than the stuff we have today because the stuff today has hormones, antibiotics, all of that foolishness in it. Now, that part of it is true, right, that that not only is it bad, but it uh, for you it's getting worse because they have genetically modified it. Yes. And we no longer are growing our own food and raising our own animals, nor Correct. do we know about black people that do those things. Correct. 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 And so a couple of weeks ago, I invited two of my coworkers to go to the vegan restaurant that I absolutely love in Portsmouth. And they went, <laughs> being good sports, they went, Dr. Lenoy. It was it was it was kind of shaky there for a while. But you know what? I didn't feel bad because first of all, they're grown, they agreed to go. And second of all, they now I know they're exposed to something different. If they want to do something different, they know where it is. It didn't bother me one bit that they were like, mm. that did not bother me one bit. So so I uh, I started down the road towards being a vegetarian. Long time ago, long time ago. We ain't gonna put no dates on it. <laughs> okay. And in that uh, traveling of it, 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 especially being in Memphis, the home of barbecue, right? Yes. Memphis is yes. The home of barbecue, and just the you know, like so, trying to go out with my friends and and, and trying to pick a place to eat. They'll, oh, well, you know, everybody else calls me DL. You know, students mm-hmm. got to call me Dr. Lenore or Dr. DL. But, it, you know, everybody else can call me DL. And so they, all of my friends call me DL. And so um, uh, they, they were like, you know, DL, uh, we got him with us. We, we, we got to go somewhere that got some um, salad. Salad. <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, especially with deep South uh, African Americans, the idea of what a vegetarian is is that they eat salads. I don't eat like salads. I've had maybe two salads in my whole life. I don't eat <laughs> salads like that. Like, like, oh, you do eat salads. No, I don't. I, really don't. I need to get into eating salads, but that's just not something I do, right? Like, I, I'm a vegetarian that don't eat salads, right? Um, and so, it, it, but how important food is in our processing of what blackness is, mm-hmm. right? Right. And and so this performativity of consumption. Right. Because when we go back to these traditions. Right. So the, it wasn't about uh, food, like these holidays. It's not about the food. It's about the gathering. Yes. It's about the family. It's right. about connecting. Right. We can connect and have different food that's not killing us. That's why we need but, to get back to having dinners together and all of this being in different rooms and dinner and all of that. My parents would have never stood for that. We had to sit down at the dinner table and eat together. Well, I, I was a latchkey kid, so I didn't grow up um, uh, like that. My mom uh, had to work a lot for me to mm-hmm. be able to, for her to just be able to, you know, put food on the table and that kind of thing. So I didn't. I didn't grow up with that. Tra- the holiday. I didn't grow up with that tradition. But I, well, holidays. Uh, and my mom just passed in October of last year. Oh my but goodness! It, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, she she made sure, like she would go all out for like Memorial Day, right? Like yes. uh, she'll mm-hmm. go all out for Labor Day because mm-hmm. for 
and, and that's how I learned what the, that the holiday isn't that important. The important thing was the gathering of family and friends and having conversation because uh, going back, like my mom, they struggled with uh, um, when I first started going down this vegetarian route. And so what they started doing was making two holiday meals. And okay. so they'll make two cabbages. Mm -hmm. so one cabbage or green <laughs> had no meat in it. Mm -hmm. And then one cabbage and green did have meat in it. So mm -hmm. she'll be like, my mom called me, son. everybody called me son that dealt with my mom. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she was like, that's son, greens and cabbage. As to say, don't touch that. Here go the green, good one. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so, uh, <laughs> but as health conditions started happening, she stopped moving away from that son's food to that all of our, like I had my own spaghetti, I had my own right. vegetables, like I had my own <laughs> everything, right? As, as they started understanding more and more the health benefits, they, they started eating the stuff on their own mm -hmm. and for it to be part of the holiday meal. And so now it's no longer sun spaghetti. This is just the spaghetti we're having. And mm -hmm. she's a cater. And so she mm -hmm. would make the vegetarian spaghetti the way that I called her. And mm -hmm. she would make the vegetarian spaghetti and then the, the beef spaghetti. And she said that the vegetarian spaghetti just sold out, <laughs> right? Like it was just gone. And then, and then she was still stuck with the um, the beef spaghetti because people really liked. And they couldn't tell that they were eating alternative meat. Right, right. Because, That's it, true. you know, of the seasoning and stuff. And so I think we're capable of it, but we got to have someone to be able to introduce us to, teach us how to season food without it killing us, right? Going back to those. Uh, herbs and spices and stuff that our our our, our grandparents and great grandparents did in their gardens, right? That's uh, right. And for for us to learn how to do herbs and spices again, instead of just salt for Lowry or some prepackaged um, um, deal. That, that is, in fact, living. If you are just joining us, we only have a few minutes left. I'm mad about that. I have Dr. Derek Lenoy uh, on the line with me. Tell me quickly about right. Prince Hall Freemasonism. Is that a word? Masonism? Mason. No, that's not a word. <laughs> okay. Help me out, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> Help me out, Doctor. I, so going back to my junior year in college, which, I, which really was my freshman year, a couple of things happened to me. The, one of the first things that happened to me was I took my first earnest uh, African-American studies classes. Um, so that's the first thing that happened to me. The second thing happened to me, I was initiated past and raised within Prince Hall Affiliated Freemasonry, and that changed my life. Um, and so how did it change my life? It started teach. I was a history major as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. It started teaching me history about the organization mm -hmm. that intersected directly with African-American history. And I didn't learn any of it in my classroom. So I thought either my organization is lying to me oh, or my oh. professors are. Okay, okay. It turns out my professors were lying yes. to me because they didn't have the information. Yes. It then made me go get that first master's and my PhD. I was seeking to, to answer the question of what role did Prince Hall Affiliated Freemasonry play in the African-American community, especially in the South. And so... Uh, Prince Hall Affiliated Freemasonry is the oldest African American institution in the United States. I'm going to say that again. It is the oldest African American institution in the United States. It was formed on March 6, 1775, when Prince Hall and 14 others were initiated into this white uh, or British lodge mm -hmm. because they could not be initiated into a United States lodge because of racism. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, the British. And the United States are already at odds with one another. Mm -hmm. So they okay. had to go to the enemy to get initiated into a fraternal organization because their countrymen that they're fighting beside did not yeah. believe mm -hmm. they should be a part of this organization. Wow. And so, and so, uh, the, so the organization... Is barred in the South itself in Louisiana, and you know Louisiana just has such a different history. 
But my research looks at Prince Hall affiliated Freemasonry since uh, the ending of enslavement because this is when it goes through its boom. Because now the majority of African Americans can participate in the organization because they're free and they are no longer um, outlaws. And what we don't know is how many African Americans were a part of this organization, man, male and female. Uh, and, and so okay. Booker T. Washington, mm-hmm. Mark, uh, Martin Delaney. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Um, um, W.B. Du Bois. Mm-hmm. Paul Robeson. My hero. Thurgood Marshall. Mm-hmm. Charles Hammond in Houston. Woo! I can keep on naming African Americans who were Prince Hall Masons who made history. But I named all those mm-hmm. because they tied the work that they did with the organization, and the organization both supported them in private mm-hmm. and in public. Thurgood Marshall said he could not have done the Brown versus Board of Education case without Prince Alfre Mason. This is his words. Wow. Right after the case, right? But mo- nobody knows that. Charles Hampton in Houston, who was with the Prince Alfre Mason, taught Thurgood Marshall to use the organization that mm-hmm. he's a part of to help fund the black movement. Okay. And okay. Charles Hampton in Houston is Thurgood Marshall's mentor, right? And, and, so, and, and so many other mentors as well. But, but... Dr. Derek Lenoy, we are running out of time, so you have to make a repeat uh, appearance because we have to finish okay. this conversation. Is is that a deal? That's a deal. That's a deal because we can. We I, I got plenty to talk about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the line. Can you tell people? People might be listening and they might want to reach out to you. Is there an email address or they can go to your website? What do you recommend? So my website is www.dlphd.com. Uh, I'm on social media at uh, so at Twitter on Twitter and on Instagram at dl underscore phd, and so they can reach out to me on those. And then of course uh, the university email is d a l a n o i s at nsu.edu. Dr. Lenoy, thank you for being on the show and thank you for taking care of our students. I call them my babies, but thank you for taking care and imparting this knowledge in, in these students today. I appreciate you for doing that. I've always believed that teachers are called. And so thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Not a problem. Also, thanks going out to Lisa McKinley. She did a great job. Don't forget, she is the owner of that 501c3 where she is providing wigs for young ladies and older ladies that need them, that are going through a tough time. It might be chemo. It might be they lost their job, whatever. It's called Wigs for Purpose, and that is the number four, Wigs for Purpose. I've had a great time with you all on this Sunday afternoon. Take care. Have a great day. Cheryl Wilkerson, Spartan Life Radio. Take care. Bye-bye.